Um, this meeting is being recorded. Thank you, Lou. That um, once again, we have another very, very um, challenging session and a terrific speaker uh, to talk about space that we're going to look at the scope and the character of challenges in outer space, uh, a domain that is very different than it was just a few years ago and is changing in ways that make the paucity of institutionalized rules and procedures increasingly problematic. Uh, our speaker this evening is retired Air Force Major General Jay Santee. We've been friends and worked together on strategic stability projects for several years, but our friendship is not Jay's most important qualification. General Santee is Vice President for Space Operations at the Aerospace Corporation. He leads that company's support to the US Space Command and several other space security and space warfare programs. Jay's a graduate of the Air Force Academy with subsequent degrees from the National War College and the Kennedy School at Harvard, among others. He deserves a much more fulsome introduction, but I don't want to detract from the time he has available to talk to us about this incredibly interesting and for those of us in the Sputnik, uh, post Sputnik generation, exciting topic. So I will let the demonstrated expertise of his presentation constitute the best testament to his ability. So Jay, thank you so much for making the time to be with us and I'll turn the program over to you. Well, thank you, Tom. And thank you to everybody for joining us tonight on, on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, I guess. And uh, I would also add, I've, I've talked to a few book clubs recently um, about the red line, which was the uh, destruction of the chemical weapons in Syria, something I had something to do with in my last assignment, but uh, I'd never have gotten to talk to an article club. So I'm very excited because I know most of the book club people just watch the movie anyway. So uh, here's that something short enough that we can all read it ahead of time. And I hope you had a chance to read the uh, Outer Space Policy by Eric Berger, the short article that came. I thought it was a particularly good narrative. Uh, there was a lot of uh, facts linked together and, and, and it was a good narrative. Sometimes it didn't go into some, some of the behind the scenes why did certain things happen as much as uh, I might have liked. But uh, again, I, I would commend it if you haven't had a chance to read it to so go ahead and look at it. Uh, I'm gonna move to the second chart, which is another way to sort of summarize what he said in the article, I guess in, in a way I would observe that uh, space to me sort of had, has had three waves. The first wave being this thing that happened in the 60s and 70s where uh, developed nations, typically, uh, mainly the United States and the Soviet Union were the folks to go to space. We took the best people and sent them there. And uh, the products that came from space from the Corona program and others went to the president and, the, and high levels of government. And so it was really to me that first wave, very expensive, very hard to do, uh, certainly uh, uh, difficult to get to the moon in one, in one decade. And it was a very elitist uh, place. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but it just was. The people who got to go there were the best specimens. Those who benefited were the, uh, the elites of the nation. And in the second wave, we sort of saw in the 80s and 90s that shift a little bit. It was still uh, mainly a large corporations starting to do it, but mainly the governments still of, uh, of nations. A few more nations joined the club, so to speak but uh, still pretty elitist as to who was launching into space, who was putting large things on orbit, some companies doing it too. But again, most of the products now uh, starting to, some of the products starting to shift from uh, just the elites to, to the populace. Things like GPS uh, coming down to people, uh, photographs of, of space and from space started to become more commonplace. Certainly uh, live, tech, live TV from around the world started to get broadcast to our homes, those kinds of things. And then uh, in the 2000s and on, we kind of hit this third wave where uh, space tourism takes off. Uh, almost all vehicles, cars, trucks have a couple different space segments in them from GPS programs to satellite radios. And we really get to this idea of it being a populist capability to go to space. College students are building satellites and getting them launched and uh, populist benefits to all. And that's really where we are today. 
Uh, there's also been some other things happen. The third ta third wave we'll get into and talk to. But if you think of it as shifting from elitist to a populist, uh, we're really on the verge of of another big wave, I think. And we'll talk about that towards the end as as we get to it. But I, I tend to view everything in Eric's paper sort of as as tracking back to something more along these lines in just a very simplified way. And of course. When you look at things simply, you leave a lot of detail out. So I'm sure there's plenty of uh, plenty of exceptions to some folks may have and say you don't quite have it right here. But but largely, I think I do. Um, I'd like to shift to 2009. Uh, in in 2009, I got summoned to the Pentagon. I was uh, took over a, an office that at that time ran a policy for the Department of Defense for missile defense, nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear strategy and deterrence, cyber operations and and policy as well as uh, uh, space. And uh, during this time frame of 2009, I, I want to talk about the fact that I think largely our national space policy shifted pretty dramatically. And if you think about 2009, we're about halfway through that third wave. A lot of things have started to become apparent to us. Uh, President Obama's coming in. We'll talk about it a little bit this more in a minute. But we make some fundamental shifts from the previous strategies, which while every president had a national space policy, those policies typically changed the words to sort of match the party's uh, words for things, but the, the overall direction and scope didn't change. There was a fairly substantial, I believe, pivot in 2009, and we'll get in and look at that. And the second thing we'll talk about is this idea of a national security space strategy that was written in that same time frame to match the policy. Uh, again, another pretty seminal document. There, to my knowledge, had never been one before and never been one since. And the significance of a national security space policy means the Office of, uh, uh, of the uh, Director of National Intelligence, as well as the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, combined to write a to strategy together on how to tackle space. So when we look at the strategic context that was going on in 2009, um, <clears throat> largely, uh, President Bush's national policy and, and most of those before uh, had not been realized. They were largely toothless. It was somewhat of a unilateral space dominance kind of part policy. And we really didn't have the capabilities and probably not the intent to back it up. We had a lot of strong words that uh, that didn't go much further. Uh, there was no national security space strategy, as, as I said. And my office had recently uh, task and had completed by the Eisenhower Center, a policy center out of the U.S. Air Force Academy, uh, uh, complete a, a study on space deterrence that became pretty important to that overall strategy that we ended up writing. We had a new president with a new philosophy and Congress had also directed for one of the first times in recent history, at least that I know of, an entire space posture review. And part of the reason we generated and did the strategy was the uh, ODNI folks on their staff said, you know, if we don't have a strategy, just about any posture would do. And it really was true, but I think at the time it was less because that was true that they gave us back the task of writing this strategy and more of the fact that they really didn't want to do it and they didn't think we could actually write a strategy that we could get agreement between the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. But that's probably rather cynical of me, but it, but that is kind of the way it felt at the time, at least the way the meeting unfolded when it was assigned to us. The international governance is also interesting. You know, there were various activities going on, like the Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, which really is more focused on norms of behavior and, and behaviors in space. And there was also the United Nations Conference on the Disarmament that takes place in Geneva, and that's more on arms control. And there's real tension between where space should go should we be under an arms control kind of agreement or, or should we be under more of a behaviors kind of a structure? And obviously the Russians, Chinese, and most of the world were all out trying to control weapons. But this was really problematic for us. If you think about 9-11, uh, an airliner was turned into a weapon. So it's very hard to define what a weapon is. It's very hard to verify. Uh, the treaty really was a problem, not because we wanted to put weapons in space, but more because we didn't know how we would ever enforce it. And then recently, within the, the two years prior, China had tested this uh, ASAT, this direct descent, if you remember, the surface to space missile that had destroyed one of their satellites and created uh, thousands of pieces of debris, which are still quite, uh, which are still on orbit and still coming down. But that had prompted the Europeans to say, maybe we ought to look more at a code of conduct, which would be something that would lend itself more back to the Copius Committee in Vienna, looking at conduct and behaviors in space rather than arms control. 
Also in 2009, uh, another interesting thing that started happening in the area of space, our traditional kind of five eyes, intelligence partners, Australia, Britain, Canada, they remained allies, but largely they didn't have their own space capability. They were reliant on ours. While other traditional allies like France, Germany, India to some extent, Italy, Japan, they had all become competitors. And this was largely because of uh, activities that had gone on in export control, which we'll talk about in a second. Of course, Iran and North Korea were already launching and they were putting things on orbit or at least trying to. And China and Russia were looked at as aggressors, except that we really didn't want to call them that yet in 2009. And if you recall, this was when we were trying to do a reset with Russia and other things. Our industrial base had had, uh, on the national security side, lots of overruns, long acquisition timelines, literally taking decades to, to go through the research and development and then start building satellite after satellite for maybe 20 to 30 years. Well, a sing single company would develop a lot of expertise in an area, but there really was no competition because no one's going to hold a workforce for 20 years in the hopes they can recompete for a contract at some point. We also looked at the statistics that uh, space area, uh, most of the workforce, most of the engineers were, it, were aging. And this export control, namely the ITAR, the, uh, the, the treatment of, of all space parts and components as weapons, as arms for export reasons, uh, was really behind a lot of the things that I discussed earlier where the free world uh, had become real competitors in space. And what had happened in the 90s there had been a, a, a commercial or an, a launch of satellites out of China that had had American involvement. The satellite had uh, blown up. And during the safety and accident review that ensued, uh, some of our important and, and sensitive technologies had been released to China. And as a reaction to that, uh, the Congress passed uh, a law that put all space components onto the ITAR uh, list which is the uh, arms control regime, which meant essentially a star tracker became as difficult to export as a sensitive tank or a long range munition or, or, or any other military component or weapon. And so when that happened, it was very difficult for our industries to compete and get their components released to other countries and other countries took advantage of that and started to make uh, components. And although they weren't as good as ours, they were more readily available for use in other activities. And then finally, a lot of question on how national security budgets would go. Uh, we now know how they went in, in hindsight, but a lot of questions at the time. So if you look and compare this context between then and now, uh, circa 1960, you had two nations, Soviet Union and us. Our focus was on the Cold War, race to the moon, uh, trying to determine the intelligence gap. Uh, uh, military uh, activities were largely tied to nuclear war. We, that was our eyes and ears in space to detect launches and then send messages out to our forces uh, after the president had made decisions. Uh, commercial, I, I kind of jokingly say Tang, there was Telstar, there was some commercial activity for communications and others, but not a, a large amount. And we tested ASAT weapons in the 80s and the Russians did, or the Soviet Union did also, but largely we, we gave those programs up because we realized that an attack was going to be on part of the nuclear deterrent. And really it was a prelude to nuclear war and that tie made it really uh, un, untenable for either side to attack each other's space systems. Also in the SALT treaties and things, they had put, they had put uh, uh, act, uh, language in there that said, you know, national technical means would not be attacked as part of the treaty. And our industrial base uh, uh, grew in the 60s. Obviously, we're on the way to the moon. We've got corona programs. We've got military space programs. And there was other, no other foreign competitor. Largely, the framework that was established was the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. It's rather vague in, in what it has. It has uh, uh, like nine articles, but not a lot there. And over this time, uh, really, our strategy became one of unilateral dominance. There was no one to partner with, and the only other competitor was our uh, our biggest enemy, the, the Soviet Union. And uh, we found ourselves in a much different situation in 2009. More than 60 nations and entities were in space. The focus was on space to the masses, like we talked about before. Uh, Civil program at that time was trying to go to Mars. The intelligence community was supporting counterterrorism as well as indications and warning back to the nation. 
Uh, GPS is being used by golfers on golf course as well as military in contact with the enemy. And if you had $250,000 in those days, uh, you could buy a seat on Elon Musk's satellite, all the it had yet to prove, or his booster it had yet to prove itself that he was selling rides at those kind of prices. And we had so in, embedded our military capabilities into our sort of find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess our, our kill chains that the adversary said, we almost have to attack their space systems because they're so lethal with their current systems and the way they use them. Uh, if we don't do so, we certainly cannot compete with the United States. Our industrial base, base had shrunk, again, because of the ITAR rules I talked about and this fact that foreign competitors proliferated. But yet, when you get to the framework and the strategy, it had remained largely unchanged since the 1960s. So this sprung up the uh, notion of the congested, contested, and competitive that was touched on in the article. Uh, you can see some of the numbers there, you know, 22,000. Those are much, much higher now, over a decade later. Uh, and, and our sensors have gotten better, but I mean, it, it, it's it got an, at least another zero on the end of that, of, of the kind of things that we're, we're tracking today. In the contested area, of course, we all know how the threats have gone from that one surface to air missile and things uh, 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 proliferated greatly. Uh, competitive, you can look at those market shares. It's pretty shocking. Uh, in just 10 years, we we went from about 65 share percent share of the market to 30. And then again, we talked about the cost. So the national space policy came about and had a series of principles that were written right into the front of it that start to show how we're going to change as a nation to address this kind of an idea. Uh, first, we said, you know, it's everybody's interest that we act responsibly and prevent mishaps and, and misperceptions and mistrust. We want a competitive space sector, sector. It's vital to our national security from a national security standpoint, as well as uh, just an economic standpoint for the nation and, and to promote commercial activity. We said, you know, rather than this idea of unilateral dominance, all rate, all nations have this right. And, and we all should be able to benefit from space and no one should be allowed to claim the celestial bodies. And, and then it says, we're gonna employ, you know, basically the all the instruments in our national power to, to ensure space is available for all and that we act responsibly. We set out a series of goals to strengthen stability, expand international cooperation, increase assurance and resilience of mission essential functions, energize our competitive uh, domestic industries and pursue human and robotics activities in space and, and improve space-based observation. Now, the interesting thing was, uh, this was the first time in at least uh, several years where, or several policies where all sectors were given the same goals. Typically, the policy had been divided into a civil, Mil a sort of civil national security a a and a, um, a commercial. But this was the first time that actually all were given the same set of goals, which is interesting when you think uh, NASA and commercial are be given the same goals of resilience a a as the national security people. Just to give you an idea of how the language changed, when you look at uh, some of the key issues, and there's two slides of these on vital interests, international order, rights and responsibilities, we'll get to three more. The 2006 policy was all about objects and capabilities, and that's what was in our vital interest. And the 2010 policy, when it was finally signed in 2010, it was about sustainability and stability and free access, more concepts and ideals. The international order, we were opposed to any new legal regimes, and now in 2010, we're gonna pursue transparency and norms and confidence building because we recognized that this idea of freedom of action, you have a lot more of it if you're able to put the right balance of norms and confidence building measures in place. Uh, we actually would consider some arms control measures under some circumstances where in the past we were not willing to. And then rights and responsibilities, you notice it was all about the United States rights and now it becomes more about everyone's rights. For mission assurance and resilience, it was all that idea of defend and unilateral dominance. And now it's more about defense and resilience and, and being able to withstand adversity in space. And then on for offense and defense, you know, it was again, freedom of action, deny others. So we can do what we want, others can't. And now it's more about assuring everyone can use space responsibly and the hair right of self-defense. We're not gonna be offensive about this, we'll just defend ourselves. 
And then finally, export controls, rarely case by case. And now we're saying, hey, we really need to sort of relook at export controls and get those fixed. Uh, so, Jay, Jay this, Lou, there's a, uh, a box near the bottom of your screen that's obscuring some of the text. Can you push the hide button? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, if I screw anything else up, tell me. So I, I want to pause there for a second and just say, uh, it, it's interesting. Normally, you would write your policy and then uh, then your strategy. And in this case, what actually happened a little behind the scenes, uh, we worked with the the uh, the intelligence community. We, the Department of Defense, worked with the the both the NRO and the uh, ODNI staff uh, on the strategy, and we worked for almost a year. Uh, through all of 2009 and into 2010. And all the way through, it was really uh, difficult. What I would say is the, the DOD was more progressive at that time than the IC was on uh, using like that comparison chart. I remember briefing that comparison chart and getting to the end with the red question marks and having someone from the intelligence community saying, uh, you're not suggesting we should change, are you? And, and you think about everything about the context has changed. Of course, we're suggesting we should change. In fact, that's the whole point of the chart, chart is to suggest that. But even though we were more progressive, what tended to happen as you wrote these documents, you sort of wander, water them down to the point of what people are willing to sign. And we kept taking a lot of things out we thought were important until we got to something that the intelligence community said they would sign. And so we got where we were delivering this up to uh, through through the policy office of the Secretary of Defense, and it got to the Under Secretary for Policy Office, and they said the document's vacuous, which is kind of funny for a space document to be vacuous, but um, they weren't going to sign it. And here we had taken so much out that we thought was important uh, to get the intelligence community to sign it that we paused the strategy. And we said, we'll turn our attention and write the policy with the entire interagency in the hopes that we could get the policy to say a lot more, which I think you just saw it did. And then we'd return to the strategy and revisit some of the things that we had to take out that made it vacuous. So that's what ended up happening. And the strategy did end up being released after the policy, but it wasn't because we had gone through the exercise of working with the intelligence community. And I think uh, they largely through this process came a long way. I mean, in the end, they were in agreement with what I'm about to show you in the strategy. But it, the first versions didn't have that, even though uh, we had worked quite hard to get everybody on board to do it. And again, it's just a little of how the interagency process works with, with each of the uh, interagency players like NOAA and, and uh, Department of Transportation and other, uh, others all kind of getting their vote and mixing it up. Um, so now we turn back to the strategy that became, again, what would be implementing the policy at the national level by the uh, intelligence community as well as the Department of Defense. And we pulled out three sets of objectives that align nicely. If you look at safety, stability, security in space, we have a shared responsibility for the domain. We want to maintain and enhance our national security advantages afforded by space. And then finally, we wanted to work on this industrial base. And it's really kind of fantastic that, that the uh, national security apparatus would be interested in re removing these ITAR restrictions and things because we literally saw that this was key to our affordability and key to keeping us innovative and key to having that be uh, com and our, to be commercially viable, to be able to use all those things for our national security uh, in the long run. And so uh, I'll tell you one more short story here. Uh, when we announced this, the consortium of, of commercial companies that have been working to get these ITAR restrictions lifted uh, came to me and said it was going to be quite impossible. And I said, we're going to do it this year. And they told me that I didn't know what I was doing and that I was too, too new to this. And I'm happy to say, you'll see later in the brief, we actually did deliver it in, in that very year. Uh, when you can unite the government as we had through the interagency process and then bring those different people forward with, along with the stat, statistics uh, to, to congressmen and senators, uh, you can do a lot of change. But the commercial community had been unable to do it just working alone without the help of the government. Uh, first, I'm just going to talk now about a couple of the norms. Uh, there's like four or five here. First, this idea of international norms. We're still not there on norms. We've come a long way in the 10 years. But we said it's essential to have norms for the following reasons, right? 
bring order to congestion, promote efficiency, right? The tighter I can put satellites because we have some norms about how often we'll keep our station keeping and how close we can fly to each other. That promotes more bandwidth, for instance, in the geo belt, which in, it promotes more commerce. Uh, it, it helps us infer intent. If you're breaking the rules, you're a nation and you're breaking the rules in one area of space, maybe one time, that's one thing, maybe a mistake. If you're breaking that eight different places across the geosynchronous belt, for instance, getting too close, that's probably a different inference of intent. It certainly distinguishes this kind of irresponsible behavior. If there's no rules, how do you say someone's breaking them? And if you have rules and people are generally following them, you can start to understand uh, and, and avoid this idea of miscalculating what someone else is doing and creating misperceptions that could lead to conflict and destabilize the regime. And then finally, like I talked about, it's a way to identify aggressors. And so there were some things on the table that we were trying to do. And then we knew situational awareness or knowing what's going on in space and knowing that we had really pretty good capabilities along with Russia, but knowing that sharing that with everybody so that there was transparency of what was happening was be key to any norm that you're gonna have. No one's gonna sign up for a norm if they don't think it can be uh, uh, enforced or at least known when people are breaking it. The next thing uh, is this idea of selective collaboration. I can't tell you how uh, difficult, if norms was hard to get through to people and, and hard to get people sold that we needed to have it, because again, there's still a lot of love for freedom of action. Uh, this idea of working in a coalition is was equally foreign at the time, pardon the pun. Uh, when you think about it, if you want to form a coalition in the air, people's airplanes can join up and get a common tasking order and meet and fly together. If people want to form a, a flotilla, ships from all nations can come and join and and literally on the fly uh, 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 go and, and form a flotilla and form a fleet. If you want to bring your space assets together, you're talking about wiring systems together and porting data into like a data lake for sharing. You're talking about tasking orders uh, over systems that don't exist. So you really have to go back and engineer this in from the beginning in a lot of ways. And so we recognize that coalitions presented a lot of advantages to us, which are listed on the slide, but it was a difficult slog to get people to understand that you should do that. And of course, uh, we're working with our intelligence community partners who every time you offer to bring in another country, they're thinking that's another chance at, at some sort of an intelligence spill or spying on us, quite frankly. If you let them into the tent and into your networks to share data, it's going to be problematic. Um, you can see then some practical applications that we talked about here and how we might try and do it. But again, uh, it really can't be formed on the fly. You have to do this rather deliberately and you have to do it almost in an engineering way and in, in an architecture way. Then, of course, there were shields, you know, defending yourself from attack, denying benefits, this idea of resiliency. And, and how do we uh, in, integrate our systems in a way that we can protect ourselves? And, and how do other domains do it? This whole notion of coming under attack in space and being able to protect yourself and not have your mission fail was very new to space. I, I almost liken it as that we had the world's greatest track team, which were individual events. And we later summed up the points and we had the world's greatest individual track team. But now to be resilient, we have to work together and we had to play a game called football where you know, the athletes might still be of high caliber, but they were gonna need different equipment, different coaching, different recruiting, everything. And really it was more like rugby. Now I've seen that play, but I really don't know the rules. And this is where we were and still are in many ways today in a war in space. How will it unfold? How will it be played? And how will things work? But all through it, we knew we had to be resilient. We couldn't be essentially clay pigeons. We'll talk more about this in a little bit too. And then finally, a Spears way, right? What's our way to impose costs should they do? And this became uh, uh, an idea, uh, uh, sparked the ideas of, of working together with our coalition partners, but look, working across all domains, not just in space. Because in 2009, uh, both Russia and China were not nearly as dependent on space systems as we were. Now that's changed quite a bit in the last decade. They're uh, extending their lethality, which is you know, a factor of how far you can see and how far you can shoot by integrating space systems uh, to now be able to see farther, 
then their missiles can actually fly in many cases. So uh, this is a change that now uh, brings forth the idea of, do we try and have spears that are, that are uh, able to do something in space? It's a new question set facing us as a nation. And then finally, the export control I talked to you about uh, was another, the last way that we uh, uh, went after. And I said, as I said earlier, we were successful in that. So this new strategy really changed the game from our perspective. Uh, largely, if you think about now, as I've gone through this, this is essentially the same strategy that we have uh, uh, under President Trump. Uh, President Biden hasn't put forward a national space policy yet, but uh, the Trump one largely followed the Obama one. And uh, we would expect that Biden's will uh, largely follow the, the one that I briefed that we put together in 2010. Now it'll be different, say different things. There certainly have some new pieces to it, don't get me wrong. But it, I think it will you'll see continued uh, activities along the way we've done because norms and collaboration al uh, alone aren't enough to protect you from someone who's going to attack you in space. And shields and spears aren't enough because they don't dress, direct the competitive nature and the congested nature, et cetera. So you need all four. And when you apply them, as we've said, uh, it really allows you to have a pretty strong and tight strategy and policy to go with it uh, for the nation to pursue. So again, I think pretty fundamental shift in 2009, little insight on where we got to and how, and how we got there. Uh, this was kind of the summary slide in one of the briefs we had about deterring and winning, again, from a DOD perspective, using norms and, uh, and collaboration and denial benefit and imposition of cost. So that brings us to today. Well, what are the great decisions of today in space? So let's probably not as extensively as I did before, just take a look at um, what, where are we and, and what is the strategic context look like now? Oh goodness, that wasn't meant to be two charts, but I guess it is. Um, let's look just for real quickly at venture capitalism and uh, and how or venture capital and how it's flown into the space segment. Uh, what you see here is a charts running from like 1997 out to 2021, and what you'll notice is there were a couple key times the investments really came up in 2000. We had the bubble and reset, and they started forward. Uh, again, to 2008's mark there, but really it didn't make its way into space. There was a little bit of a downtick there. You know, you, you could say from uh, 38 billion to 28, it's a ten, pretty significant percentage wise downtick, but the numbers were so small in those days. And then you see it start coming out in the, throughout the uh, 15s, 17s, 18s, uh, out to the COVID pandemic bubble. And my goodness, what it's done in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of venture capital flowing into space, a lot of activity in space, probably not a lot of these companies going to, you know, make it if this uh, pandemic bubble bursts. I think the last time I looked earlier this year, the Fed prime interest rate was running at negative 7.5 and inflation was running at 8%. I don't know how we sustain that over the long run. Uh, I, I do predict that there'll be some uh, move, changes here. But, uh, but again, how far down and where it will reset to, I'm, I just don't know, just don't know. We look at uh, national security space for a minute. This third wave we talk about is also contested. Not only have they continued to build all types of weapons, they being Russia and China, and China probably more so than Russia, but certainly uh, Russia has its programs too. We have space-to-space -space interceptors. We have surface-to-space missiles that can affect all the orbital regimes. We have um, directed energy weapons and RF energy weapons. We have uh, all kinds of uh, cyber weapons against uh, all of all aspects of the space enterprise, to include the ground nodes and, and space nodes. So, really, a, a rather prolific set of threats uh, facing us. But equally so, like I alluded to before, uh, and, and also alarming, is their ability now, uh, and probably especially China, to use their navigation systems, their intelligence uh, collection systems to form kill chains that extend well beyond, beyond what we refer to as the second island chains, well out into the Pacific uh, against ships moving across the, the Pacific region. Uh, this is pretty troubling to us uh, across the board, this uh, you know, the third wave being contested the way it is in the national security business. Uh, to, to respond to that, 
We did some more work on this resilience techno taxonomy and OSD policy has come out on directing us to look at what they call space domain mission assurance. And you can see some defensive operations to include off-board protection. So things that would be off of the satellite, sort of like you do in air, you have assets that aren't on board the airplane, wild weasels, uh, electronic jammers like a, a, a growler or something like that. And, and things off board the aircraft to, to sort of help all the other uh, aircraft that are in part of the strike raid. You have an ability to reconstitute. If you lose things, uh, you should be able to relaunch or, or put things back in place that you've lost. And then finally, resilience to include the idea of onboard self-protection, like an air, aircraft, radar warning receivers, uh, chaff and flares, maybe a jammer to, to fool a, a RF guided missile kind of thing. And then within that resilience, six different ways and really, the key here is there's no silver bullet to any one of these. If you do just one, it's probably not enough. If you do a couple, when you're trying to make your architecture resilient, you're probably gonna be much better off because we find there's great synergism our analysis points to. When you're able to do things like make more of certain satellites, split functions across, uh, use deception, et cetera. Those are all pretty good ways to try and create resilience at an enterprise level. You may lose some individual satellites, but overall the idea is to, to have enough satellites left to continue doing the mission. Then we look at NASA. Uh, they've largely now settled on the Artemis program. That's continued through two administrations. One of the major problems we were having was, you know, kind of getting people to agree and sticking to something. Uh, is it going to be Mars? Is it going to be the moon? But one of the things I guess I'd, I'd have you note here is uh, they're back building their own launch systems, but also you look at it and say, look what they're trying to do in a gateway uh, configuration concept again. And, and why I think it's terribly interesting to look at, and I know I've got part of the picture covered up. It's not just NASA, it's, it's ESA, it's JAX. It's a lot of the, a lot of the nations are taking part in this program. So it's a much more collaborative program that, than we have done in the past with say just a Russia or other nations where uh, more people are actually putting uh, pieces in place to be part of this enterprise. And then what's commercial doing? So I, I pulled this from a recent headline about uh, Jeff Bezos, one of, the, one of the billionaires that's trying to get in space. We all know Elon Musk has pointed at Mars, but Jeff uh, Bezos has kind of been quiet about this, not as much flash and not as much uh, uh, noise being made by him. But I highlight in blue, you know, his idea is to build an, this idea of space infrastructure and in infrastructure in space, and then allow entrepreneurs of the next generation build on that infrastructure. At one point in time, several years ago, I heard him say, you know, I really didn't build anything new or do anything new. I took things that were existing like the internet and like an ability to securely pay on the internet. And somebody else had an ability to deliver things overnight. And I linked it together in a new way to sell books to people and all kinds of other stuff that we probably don't need, but we look forward to getting. And he's become one of the richest men in the world based on taking advantage of the infrastructure that was in place at the time and linking it in a new way. And he's really saying, that's why I want to go to space. I want to put the infrastructure there so people can link this together in a new way and be entrepreneurs and generate more money. So that's kind of interesting to think about. There's a professor at uh, MIT Ali, as he goes by, Devec. Uh, starting in 2007, he and his students have taken a real look at space logistics. He was the person behind getting the AIAA to uh, agree to this definition you see here about space logistics being the theory and practice of driving space system design for oper operability of managing the flow of material services information needed throughout the space system lifecycle. In the military sense, we look at logistics or sustainment and say it's the ability to sustain the fight in a certain domain. He went back and looked at these Antarctica trips down in the lower left and he said, you know, when we first went there to try and do the high five, we couldn't even make it across because of logistics and sustainment. And then he part, plots, plots on a graph the number of exploration attempts over the years. And you watch how it goes up and about halfway up that line is where it really starts to get steep and that's the year we really get serious about logistics. If you're going to do the high five, you don't need the logistics. You can climb Mount Everest and say you did it. But if you're going to go and have it the top of Mount Everest, you're going to need to set up a pretty robust logistics and sustainment. If you're going to do real in-depth exploration and continued uh, activities. And so 
This idea of space logistics that Bezos and others have come across that will probably be needed when you go back and look at the military strategies I talked about of, uh, of, of expendables and, and expending fuel to get out of the way of threats, as well as the notion of um, NASA building uh, large working structures in space. Uh, these all are things that are gonna take a fair amount of space logistics. He's gone so far as to put models together and look at, okay, different scenarios all the way out in Mars up at the top uh, top right and, and Earth down there and, and different missions where if you're trying to set something up on the moon, if you're trying to set something up on Mars or some of the other celestial bodies, where would you need links and nodes and how would you do it? And uh, I, I'll, I'll just stay there for one more second. So he's done a lot of academic thought on that. Uh, in the last month, General Raymond, the Chief of Space Operations for the Space Force, has come out and signed an, an integrated capabilities document. That's a requirement document for servicing and maneuver on orbit. Uh, these are US Space Force charts that kind of show the kind of things they've been thinking about trying to do. But you can see part of it is maneuver without regret. Right now, fuel is pretty precious. precious. It's typically one of the limiting factors on satellites, even in the geo belt, as they run out of fuel before they run out of mission life. And so this idea of servicing and refueling becomes important. And in this ICD, although most of it's classified, and I can't get into exactly what it says they want to have done, I will say in the cover document that's unclassified, they're really looking for commercial services to lead the way. And so I come to this question somewhat rhetorically, I guess, you know, is this today's great decision? Also in this month, April of 2022, uh, the, the uh, Office of the President has published this idea of an in-service, in-space servicing assembly and manufacturing national strategy. And they've posed six goals in there to advance this kind of resource, research, prioritize the expansion of the infrastructure, accelerate the commercial industry, promote international cl collaboration and cooperation to achieve these goals, prioritize environmental sustainability and inspire a diverse workforce. It's pretty ambitious, but the thing I really look at and say is NASA is gonna need this to do some of the activities they wanna do in space. The Department of Defense needs this and they're all gonna lean on commercial services. And so there's a commercial industry here and when you come back and think about the things you're gonna to have to drive here, it's gonna be standards, protocols, interfaces to enable this kind of uh, refueling depots and movement and transportation and tugging of materials around space and servicing, manufacturing, robotics, all stuff that could really promote a whole new generation of people who are excited about space, as we've seen with some of the commercial operators like Bezos and, and Musk and their recruitment of younger people who are interested in getting into this, as well as putting the United States at the forefront of driving this whole idea of, uh, of, of expansion into uh, living and staying in space, not just high-fiving, but actual inhabitation and move forward of space. And that will bring me to the end of the presentation. And I, I really am uh, looking forward to your comments. The, um, the picture here is an artist's rendition of 2001 A Space Odyssey, something that I remember seeing as a child and thinking about how cool that would be. And of course, 2001 came and went. And I would say it came and went because we didn't have this idea of space sustainment and logistics that it takes to do this kind of uh, exciting exploration work. Thank you, Jay, that was terrific. That. Um... Uh, a reminder to use the chat function if you have questions. Uh, I will uh, moderate them, and I have uh, at least one uh, so far. But as I wait for people to enter question, just a, a couple of observations that uh, I think illustrate and underscore points that Jay has made. Um, one is we're talking about incredible developments over a lifetime. Now, I can remember as a kid standing in the front yard to watch Sputnik go overhead. Uh, and we were all gonna become engineers and save our country um, by participating in the space race. Uh, jump ahead in my own, own career to the late seventies where I was involved in rewriting export controls, a portion of which shaped 
the International uh, Traffic and Arms Regulations, ITAR, that Jay mentioned, which was an incredibly difficult exercise. Trying to write rules that weren't instantly rendered obsolete by advances in technology. That in my first months as the Deputy Director of National Intelligence, I was pulled into decision on whether or not to continue to fund a hugely expensive satellite system that was to be both defense and intelligence. Uh, it was multiple billions of dollars and billions of dollars had already been spent. Um, we determined along with DOD that we had to kill this thing because it could only succeed if we had three technological miracles along the way. Um, that was very unpopular with the uh, House of Representatives. The Senate loved, hated this thing and the House of Representatives loved it. Billions of dollars. Four years later, I had just returned to Stanford and within the first months that I was back on campus, I was visited by a group of graduate students who had built a couple of mini satellites for a few thousand dollars using mostly components that they bought at Radio Shack. Radio Shack no longer exists, but the satellites that they built became BoxSat and is now a subdivision of Google. Um, that the changes in cost, the changes in accessibility um, and the tremendous increase in the number of objects in space, the need for deconfliction is, in, is enormous. Um, a part of the first question actually links to uh, the dramatic increase in the number of players and the number of objects. And that question is, how are military and commercial space systems integrated uh, or not integrated, I guess, is the other half of the question. So that's a great question. And there's sort of an, an answer that says it, it, it depends. Uh, some of the commercial, let's start on the ground for just a second. There are some really pretty good capabilities in the commercial segment for telescopes and, 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 and radars that are on the ground to do situational awareness. And you can kind of see how that could be integrated fairly easily. You, you buy their data or services and you know bring it in and combine it with your data and that you might have from sensors that are uh, produce data of a classified nature and combine that to put a picture together. So that's pretty reasonable to see how it might happen. Uh, commercial SATCOM right now, I, 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 I don't mind the figures aren't exact on, but you know, it used to be 70% or so of all of our satellite communications used by the military was over commercially leased circuits. And, and, and we had the equipment that was compatible with that. And it was integrated in the sense that, you know, different people would have access to a channel and you would lease your channel, but uh, not integrated in the sense if they started getting interfered with that we'd be able to quickly switch the highest priority users from one channel to another that was perhaps not being interfered with. And so there are commercial capabilities out there that do that automatically across vendors. So different vendors will even go and be able to move beams, move, move users to other vendors' satellites uh, using this commercial equipment. And so the military is quite interested, as you can imagine, in that kind of uh, capability for themselves. So uh, that's another way that it could be integrated. Um, the notion then of uh, some of the more difficult things, uh, commercial imagery is another one you could look at and say commercial imagery integrates very well with uh, national uh, technical means imagery, kind of uh, intelligence community imagery. Again, that can all be brought down to the ground and then classified at different levels depending on where it came from and, and shared with others. So commercial imagery has been uh, as, as another area that's very important to integrate. And the advantage of it to the military forces is in many cases, the commercial imagery is good enough for our needs and is, doesn't come with the burden of being classified that it was collected through a sensitive uh, in, intelligence asset. And so there's great, uh, uh, great efforts to use that commercial. In fact, the Army has systems that uh, 
for many years operating, they, they had, don't use maps anymore. They use commercial imagery and overlay uh, the street names or, or, or landmarks and things on top of the imagery uh, through quick processes and get out real-time pictures so that uh, I remember working as far back as Katrina, Katrina flooding of, uh, of New Orleans and getting commercial imagery and posting pictures every day with uh, where the floodwaters were and, and how they were moving uh, all overlaid and what you would think would look more like a map. So I, I hope that kind of gets at the question of how we are able to integrate some. I, I think you're going to see a lot more of that, though, in the future. I think you're going to see almost uh, the military looking for some some purpose. Oh, I, I left out. I'm sorry. I want to go back and talk about launch for a minute. Obviously, launch services uh, space is completely the whole logistics sustainment that we talked about. I mean, it starts with launch. And in many cases, military and intelligence community satellites now are being launched as, uh, off of a service contract, right? That someone has the provide a service to, to inject a satellite to a certain orbital position and, and that we buy that as a service rather than uh, buying the booster and taking the risk on ourselves and having to figure it out. Now, again, you're pushing the risk around and, uh, and in the end, if the, if the system doesn't get to where it does, even though you had a service contract, it's you who's going to live with the risk of having a hole in your architecture. But but those are all ways that we've looked at doing things and, and do integrate commercial. And, and again, I think there's a, a case to be made for more commercial to be brought in on the parts of the architecture that you don't need to be quite as uh, resilient or robust because obviously commercial has inherent problems that uh, uh, there's a big difference between your commercial car and a, and a Jeep, for instance, or a Humvee, right? So that there's different aspects of protection and, and levels of security that go into the military systems. But when you can use something that's less to get uh, the, the, the delivery of effects you need, why not? So that's a rather long answer to a pretty good question, but I hope it gives you some of the ideas how we're already using an integrating commercial. It's a good answer to a good question. Next question I have is, how should we cooperate with nations whose behavior on earth we find uh, objectionable, problematic? Um, the question doesn't illustrate it, but US-Russia cooperation on the space station and getting people to and fro. Yeah, I think with our eyes open, certainly. Uh, I, 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 I have to, I'll just give you a, a short, I mean, literally with your eyes open, right? I mean, we thought we were pretty good with Russia, uh, working with them. In fact, there's an aerospace, the company I work for, employee on an exchange right now, uh, living in kind of a biosphere in Russia, where their nine or 10 people were selected to be isolated from the outside world, only means of communication like emails a few times a day uh, kind of thing. And she's in there and she has, as far as we can tell, no idea, uh, uh, no knowledge of what's going on in the Ukraine right now. And so we're really afraid for her. You know, I, 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 we know her, she's a colleague of ours and, and uh, we've sort of sent her messages, but you know, they censor anything that goes in and out. So I guess at a very personal level, there's that going on that I'm aware of, but also you have the the senior uh, uh, Roscosmos official saying, you know, uh, we're not going to cooperate with the United States anymore. And so th this is something we've done since, you know, as as I think Eric Berger's article pointed out, as soon as we quit going to the moon, we were we were in the space station with the Russians. So I mean, this has been a longstanding thing that's, you know, proven to be pretty fragile when it comes. Uh, under war like this and we put them under such sanctions for you know invading one of their neighbors uh i, I would just come back and say um at a macro level and the things i work with tom on you're seeing a national space policy and a national security space strategy being written in the absence of really a grand strategy for the nation of a very dangerous time that we're in of, of two other uh, nuclear powers, we can argue about how close to peer they are, but they certainly have nuclear weapons. They've certainly been rattled here in the Ukraine uh, and, and threatened us with them. And what is our national strategy? You know, in the Cold War, we had a strategy of containment. All the elements of government understood that. We were willing to pay the price to keep our nuclear triad and to keep our strategy going different things. I don't see such co cohesion. We trade with these companies. We literally, as we're Find out they can be good levers to have, but they're also uh, that trade is literally buying the surface of space missiles that China's building, right? So 
uh, th there's good and bad here. And, and I would like to see us put together a more cohesive strategy at the national level to address some of these larger questions and then let the rest of us nest in under it. So I, I hope that answers your question too. It's a little off the space. Next question I have, uh, if a country somehow, I would insert here, uh, accidentally or deliberately disabled a US satellite, what are the appropriate kinds of reactions? So I think, first, I think the context is pretty important. Um, you know, what, what else is going on in the world? We While we talk about a space war and things like that happen in space, it's really uh, more of a war that would extend into space. It may start in space, but it certainly would probably go somewhere else. So I would say that's the first thing. Uh, if it's a one-off, like I talked about before in the norms, like someone were to do something to a particular satellite, I think that's probably more something that in, in, and if there wasn't a lot of uh, increased tension going on in the world, I, I really hope that cooler heads would prevail and we would, we would be able to go back and and sort of have time to work with that country to understand why they had done what they done, maybe impose sanctions, maybe do some other things like talked about across the dime. I don't think we would necessarily over overreact over one in, in the right context. I do think if there was a lot of activity going on, say, take the Ukraine all over again, and then uh, they were to do something to one of our satellites at the start of that, that would be something that would probably get the attention of people a lot more while someone was say rattling nuclear sabers etc um, and so there there are a variety of things if and i would come back and say this is another thing that's not necessarily easy it's like cyber attacks who exactly did what and so this comes back to you saw a few times i didn't hit it in the brief but uh, how important situational awareness is can you actually attribute that to some high degree of conference, that one-off event to some country. So that'll that'll start the process, right? Can we really attribute it? And then, uh, you know, I would like to think that there are things that we would be able to do again across the dime. Now, maybe a slightly variation of that question is, how would we keep someone from doing something to our satellite to begin with? So if we saw someone approaching our satellite and getting too close, we have started to look at how, how, how do you do evasive maneuvers if someone comes in and tries to get too close to you or what you feel is too close to you? Again, without having norms of behavior, there's no, there's no definition of how close that is, but uh, we tend to have right now some practical rules that uh, we, would, we sort of put into practice and we would like others to practice that say you should keep a safe distance from us. And if someone gets inside that, how do I maneuver in such a way that uh, I don't deplete all my fuel and I can be maybe imposing on his fuel restrictions and have to move. If someone were to launch something from the ground to us, that's much easier to know who, who did it. But again, uh, we're practicing and looking at ways to take evasive actions to keep from having our satellites be uh, interfered with in that way. And then finally, I would say uh, almost every day, uh, satellites around the world are interfered with with RF energy, largely uh, largely because somebody makes a mistake and points their transmitter at the wrong satellite and interferes with the transponder on that satellite or gets their polarization off and their signal that was supposed to not interfere suddenly gets phased in and interferes with something. And so those don't really get much of a reaction except to try and figure out who's doing it and, and contact them so that they can correct their equipment settings and things. If it happens again, like I talked about purposefully, then we have ways that we would manually try and move the higher priority people to other to, to other sensors and work through it or other transponders and work through it. Again, a long answer. And if I go much further, I'm probably going to lose my security clearance, so I won't. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> but, um, you've mentioned several times the need to develop norms. And if I understood what you just said, part of the way we're doing it or maybe right now the only way we're doing it is attempting to develop best practices and, and share them in the hope that others will find and share with us. If that characterization is, isn't right, what are we doing and what are we not doing that we should be doing to get rules of the road for operations in space? 
So I mentioned copious earlier. Excuse me, just a second. I'm going to mute and cough. How's that? I'm sorry. Um, I mentioned copious, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in Vienna. Uh, we actually, uh, I'm guessing five years ago now, don't, you know, again, I could be off. Um, we actually led the international community to develop um, some accepted rules and norms of behavior. They're nothing too stunning. I think I think there were a, a couple dozen and uh, pretty basic, but it was the first step uh, along that path. So there is some international agreement. And then from that, it's a long process, right? From that, then, then you actually move, I think, into the next step is to uh, sort of formalize these. And at some point, they're on the track to maybe become international law. But they aren't to the extent that we talked about earlier, like sort of how far to stay away from satellites, because that can depend, right? If we're sort of all in the geosynchronous belt, trying to stay in the same spot over the earth at the, at the same same altitude, that's a different than two satellites in LEO that that are always uh, transiting the earth, you know, over different spots on the earth. And at the poles, perhaps, are coming really close to each other, going real fast in opposite directions. That that That's a much scarier uh, covariance problem and an overtake problem that makes things look a little bit different, something that might have been a reasonable keep out when we're both basically relatively stable to each other versus relatively unstable to each other. I think you can understand that. So across the board, those kind of norms and things have not been established. So what you have seen is uh, the Department of Defense, for instance, announced a set of rules that they are going to try and follow and that they're asking their allies to try and follow. And so they have a, 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 a they have some norms that they're trying to lead by what I would call example. Now again, not to keep out zones, but there are some things that they're trying to do to uh, put some standards out there uh, and, and have people follow. So on the one hand, Tom, there are things happening in the international community that will eventually lead to to law to norms, and then you have. Uh, just some practical things where military people who are part of a coalition saying that they're going to follow these norms themselves. The last thing I'd say is there's two efforts that I find quite interesting. Many of you may know about uh, an international law called the Law of Armed Conflict. It has, I mentioned it, I didn't talk about it, but it was on the, some of the slides. And, and it sets up laws of how nations will fight it. It, it says, like, for instance, if you're going to stab someone, you can't have like a fish hook thing on that, you know, it goes in, but then when it comes out, it rips even harder, right? It's, it's like, okay, to cleanly kill somebody, but you can't, you can't maim and you can't do things that cause greater pain than would be necessary to kill or wound a, a person and make them out of the fight. Uh, ideas of proportionality. If, if somebody does something to you, you can't do something that would cause a, a, a lot more pain back, ideas of uh, not attacking schools, those kind of things. Well, what are those kind of rules and laws, that that law set that we pretty well have understanding and practice of how it's conducted in the land, sea, and air, and what that means? What is that? How do you extend that to space? And how do you apply those? And so there's at least two groups, one being led out of Australia and one being led international groups of lawyers and one being led out of uh, Canada, I think McGill University. And, and they're both trying to look at establishing uh, some legal documentation, like books that would lawyers can refer to that would define how these laws of armed conflict should be applied to space. So that's another one to keep your eye on. So you're going to have norms for peacetime that you're going to use for strategic stability and those kind of things. And then you're going to have different norms or laws that you'll follow when you go to war. Just like in all domains, right? I didn't see many of those Russian tanks going through Ukraine, stopping at stop signs. And, you know. Yeah, but the, uh, I mean, I understand the point you're making, certainly, Jay. But is the speed of technological development uh, somehow qualitatively different in space? Uh, that uh, you know, rules of war evolved over thousands of years and armored warfare uh, over uh, more than a uh, hundred years, that 
are we running hard to stay in place in a rapidly changing environment uh, that makes it even harder? Or are the kinds of changes not on the horizon, but just over the horizon, sort of predictable. We can anticipate you solve a technical problem, you have this new capability. Yeah, well, I think what you're trying to get at is, a, I, I mean, almost all technology, you know, has a, a good and a bad to it. I mean, nuclear power, nuclear weapons, right? I mean, it, it almost all has a way it can go. So. Uh, when I put up logistics and sustainment kind of things, and I talk about, you know, a, a servicing satellite, well, one person servicing satellite could be another one's, you know, uh, robot arm that's coming to, you know, gouge your satellite. So uh, if used for nefarious reasons, it, it could certainly cause a lot of damage. And trying to get the norms down and set uh, standards of behavior over how we should operate something like a servicing satellite when, when we don't have one, we haven't had one before, we're trying to think of how we might use it. We, we're trying to look ahead and think, well, this is how we might use it today, where we are today in space, but what about 20 years from now? So you're, you're trying to bring in and look forward to an area where you really don't know. It's kind of like I said, I don't know how the rules of rugby. I really don't know how it's, I don't know why they suddenly stop and kick the ball, right? They, he seemed to be running pretty good down the field. Why did he do that? And so th that's the kind of thing where we're trying to anticipate and create norms for the peaceful uses that will uh, also not give advantage to somebody who would use them nefariously, right? To, to surprise or to do something bad. So yeah, it's, uh, it is very hard to do. And it's one of the reasons I think things on the policy side, maybe you're moving slower than what you could do on the technology side. Um, this whole idea, for instance, the idea when we when I talked about principles of not claiming sovereignty over things, some of that was over these ideas of, you know, the, the mining rights that might happen on places and things like that. And so, uh, again, we're, we're trying to tiptoe into that area when we have companies saying, hey, I want to go up and mine this, you know, asteroid because it's got lots of minerals that we can't find here on Earth are very rare. So, uh, again, how do you how do you balance that and how do you get it right? It's tough. And the last thing I'll say about space is, you know, things don't move in a straight line. It's really not intuitive. It's, it's, it's almost worse from a domain perspective. We've at least most of us have been in the water and looked underwater and see, I mean, very few of us have been to space. Very few of us understand how the physics apply differently in space. And, and you really can't, uh, unless you're, you know, like really, really a genius and have thought about this long. You really can't think like an astrophysicist has to think. You have to do the work and the math. And so uh, it, it really is a domain where uh, scientists and engineers are really needed to work with the creative entrepreneurs and others in a ways that we really haven't had to. We have in the past, but not to the extent, not to the extreme we have to here. And even more so on the policy side, right? So, uh, it, it, it is definitely an area that is, yeah, difficult and out and outpacing itself, I think, in a lot of ways. Different kind of question. You um, mentioned the uh, 2007 ASAT test of China and the amount of debris. Could you say a little more about space debris, space junk? And... If I'm recalling right, a Japanese, an article on a Japanese effort to develop a clean up the junk capability. I'm sure there are others, but uh, fool, fool's errand or practical technology? No, I think, I think we've, it's one of the things we have to get there. Um, uh, so I, um, I don't think so, but you know, let me just tell you, it's very challenging. So first, uh, first, you have to you have to work through some policy. I'll just start there. Um, right now, the Outer Space Treaty says if you launch it, you own it. You own it until it burns up in in our atmosphere or somebody else's. And so, if your satellite comes apart for some reason, or your your booster that got left on orbit comes apart for some reason, those are all still yours. 
And there isn't like undersea where if the sink the ship sinks, it's now abandoned, so to speak. And you know, at some point, any treasure hunter can come and get it. So even if I just said I created a policy to encourage like a like a challenge, hey, anybody who can bring 50 meter 50 uh, pounds of space junk back in the atmosphere and burn it up could could win you know a million dollars per pound. Well, there's a problem, right? I, I can't just go get that treasure ship because somebody owns it and I have to have their permission. And oh, you, so that, there's a thing there, right, legally. Mm -hmm. So then you move past that. Let's pretend we could get all the nations to agree that we're going to designate some of our junk as just junk and anybody can you know, claim it as, as part of their bounty. Um, then you got the notion of, well, how do you capture it? So, so you're moving in space with no reference point upon which uh, to tie yourself. And this thing, because it's junk, is probably unstable and moving in some odd direction with odd pieces sort of spinning around on it. And if you had a net or some sort of grappler or anything that could grab it, as soon as you do, you'll have to apply thrusters or something or, or just allow your thing to whatever shear motion is on that to be sheared mm -hmm. and start tumbling with it let your gyros realize the attitude and everything it's in, and then have enough fuel on board to whatever the mass of that was, plus the mass of yours, to un, un uh, state to you know to stabilize your destabilized uh, satellite now, and then deorbit it. I mean that's pretty hard. Mm -hmm. You can start working through that's some tough problems there, right? So. Uh, I don't think it's folly. I think we're going to have to do it. I think what you're going to see is, I mean, there's been a lot of work done. The, the big payoffs are going for the big pieces because the big pieces are going to keep in higher mass are going to keep coming apart and they're going to create more mass. So that if you can get one big piece, that's, you know, capture the whale, do it. Um, but how we do that yet, how we get through some of the, the other issues and then some of the norms, there's, there's also interesting things on the smaller pieces and the flex maybe just some laser energy even on them that gets them to slow down a little bit and, and, and then, you know, descend in altitude. Cause again, speed is what keeps you on orbit. If you lose speed, you come down. So if you can slow them down, there's a lot of interesting things like that. I've seen some interesting concepts for people who want to catch things in flight and they think they can apply it. But again, their hard technology part is they're going to be catching something destabilized and then they're going to own that momentum and they're going to have to somehow take care of it. So if anybody's listening and has an idea how to, how to take care of that momentum, let us know, because I've got a way to catch it. <laughs> the, uh, um, just to underscore or illustrate kind of the, the difficulty, is there an average speed at which satellites and junk are moving through space? Yeah, it's a, like 170,000 miles an hour or something like that. It's some crazy number. I mean, it's really fast. But that's that's not the hard part. I mean, I, I, I could generate whatever speed they're going, I can match. I can, mm -hmm. Right? I'm going to match it, and I'm just going to come in behind it. So the hard part is when it's moving in a destabilized fashion, mm -hmm. to be able to catch it in a way that doesn't somehow damage my my ship and then and then own their momentum and, and then stabilize that momentum that it's given to me. So that's the harder part for almost all of these. Mm -hmm. a, a question that is maybe a little outside of space, but uh, Jermaine, that um, question about uh, hyperbolic discussion of hypersonic missiles yeah. and coming over the South Pole. Um, how feasible is that in terms of fuel, um, uh, amount of, of flight time, and so forth? Is, uh, they, is, is this a big problem or not a problem? Yeah, I have to, again, I would say, you know, you mentioned Sputnik earlier, and mm -hmm. uh, General Milley called this, an, you know, sort of another Sputnik moment. I think it was more Sputnik moment than, than the real, than the first Sputnik, right? I mean, it's, it's a big problem. Um, the, the, somebody mentioned earlier about, you know, if you can't put weapons in space, the only prohibited thing about having military or weapons in space is weapons of mass destruction. And so, you know, that traditionally has come bio nuclear and, 
other than that, there's really no prohibition against it. And so if you launch a vehicle that, um, that has a weapon on board and put it in orbit, which a hypersonic could be one of those kind of vehicles, yeah, it could come from almost any direction. You can put it in any orbital regime. And then, uh, you know, as long as it can withstand reentry and not burn up, which a, which a hypersonic is somewhat designed to absorb that heat, much like, you know, space shuttle or something like that did. Uh, and, 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 and then be able to, you know, guide in on its, on its target. It's pretty pro pretty big problem, <laughs> pretty big problem to solve. And, and, the trouble with the hypersonics is, and, and I would just say some of the maneuverable, because we're really in an era now strategically of, of non-ballistic missiles. Uh, they, they all have various thrusting mechanisms or, or turning mechanisms. And, and some of the more uh, problematic ones are the hypersonics that can turn quite a bit and withstand the heat that's generated from doing that. And so they, they really can maneuver uh, once they have the energy on them. Uh, and make it very difficult to predict where they're going. And that's really another hard part about it is uh, comes back to some of the attribution and things, right? So you put some of these on orbit and then suddenly they come in. Who's were they? Where did they, where did they come from if you've lost track of them? So again, big problem uh, from a lot of different aspects. Um, I don't know if that, if that answer gets after the question. Big problem, big problem. That uh, I well, I think it does get get to the question that was asked. That an inference I draw or a conclusion I draw from the presentation is there are going to be a lot of jobs related to space, uh, given the the variety and the magnitude of challenges. What you said earlier about the erosion of our industrial capacity for space with the transformation uh, of, of that capacity sort of is is this a great area for young people interested in science or aeronautics to think space um, uh, uh, does it require great expansion of capacity of the way in which we develop whole, whole new industries in the 1960s and, and 70s before these jobs are going to be there, a chicken and an egg problem, that uh, uh, if I were 50 years younger, should I be determined on a career in space? Yeah, I, I think I think it's a great, first a great question. First, you asked it from a technology standpoint too. If you haven't figured out from this talk, which was on space policy, I think there's some really interesting jobs even in the policy arena. So if you're a if you're a policy type person and interested here, I think there's a lot that can be looked at and will be needed to be done beyond what we have. And I would say, if you're a policy type person that has some technical background to go with it, you know, doesn't hate math, it's probably even better. Um, so. I'm not, I'm, and, and certainly grand strategy, strategic stability, all the things that it takes to make good policy. Uh, I, I think that, I think all that needs some really bright young people to come into it. And then certainly if you're in the STEM area, there are a lot of great areas to go into, but this is certainly one of them. And I would say, uh, we haven't talked about it today, but the Space Force, you know, as a service was born. Uh, think about a service that's going to be operating in a technical domain that probably only four or five people, at least for the next couple of decades in the whole space force will have gone to space. And those are the astronauts they send to NASA. Maybe they get one back, right? So <clears throat> you're talking about a whole group of people who have to have a warfighting mentality. They have to be able to build uh, and acquire highly complex systems. They have to be able to do systems of systems engineering, or at least understand it to do force design. And they have a service that's literally going to recruit 600 people a year. 600 people a year. They want to recruit through data. And where I'm going is data, digital engineering. They cannot survive and compete if they continue to do it on documents. And so they're really pushing hard for a very technical workforce who can do things 
using uh, data, data manipulation applications that sort data and analyze data in new ways to reach the conclusions and things they want to reach. So I think, again, anyone joining the Space Force, anyone getting into the space industry, uh, that's just the national security side. L look at a couple of things I talked about, mining asteroids. Think about the sustained operations in space and the logistics infrastructure that it's going to take. That's fantastic to me. And I think our nation should be need leading that. Now, I did kind of say on that venture capitalism chart, I think we're going to get some reset here. But, you know, in the end, that's going to perhaps be healthy for us because the, the companies that have good plants and are able to produce, you know, valued products are, are going to succeed and come through it. it you, every once in a while, you have to pull some weeds in the garden. And I, I don't mean it to be mean, but, you know, <laughs> it, it's going to happen. It happens. It always happens. But right now, a lot of young people are going into space and, and there'll be plenty of tech jobs, I think, in the future doing very exciting things. Let me take one last question, um, which I do not want to abuse your time. You've been terrifically uh, informative and generous. The question is, wouldn't the UN or would the UN be a primary venue or vehicle for working out space cooperation? And isn't there already a space cooperation treaty? Yeah, there are, there's really the main treaty is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, but there's uh, several places, not, not just the UN. So the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is another one that, uh, that's in Vienna. Uh, a lot of activity goes on there uh, related to these norms and cooperation. So I, yeah, I don't want to take anything from the UN. They're doing great work. But like all things, you think the interagency process in our own government's hard, you know, international <laughs> progress on norms and things is tough. There's other places like the I, ITU, which is what, International Telegraph Union or something, right? But they said, yeah, telecommunications. So they set a lot of the standards and do a lot of the cooperation, right? How are we going to, because without RF, it's just, you know, or, or, or some kind of energy up and down in the satellite to, to, move, to move the data, uh, it, it's just a rock. So a lot of that comes out of those kind of places. That's where a lot of cooperation goes on. And then... At an individual level, you know, NASA, NASA has openly solicited, uh, selectively solicited uh, people to join them in the Artemis program to go to the moon. So uh, another way is just our nation leads and invites people. Uh, I can tell you the U.S. military has uh, openly taken a, a couple dozen allies into the Combined Space Operations Center is looking how to bring them in and integrate their capabilities into ours back at a technical engineering level, work across all the security concerns that the, that the community has for that. So again, there are plenty of places where there's international cooperation, I think, going on in space, not just, not just through UN committees and UN activities, but, uh, but in other areas also. Well, Jay, thank you so much for the presentation, for the responses to uh, questions. I have no doubt that the uh, several dozen people who have joined us this evening and the others who will look at the video uh, will know a lot more about space and hopefully many of them will be more excited about space as a result of this presentation. So thank you so much. Thanks to Lou uh, for uh, making it possible for us to uh, be online this evening to Charlotte to help with the announcements and so forth. That uh, to repeat the announcement that Lou made at the beginning, there will be no great decision session uh, next Sunday because it's Easter, uh, but we will meet the following week. That's the 24th, I guess it is, uh, where the subject is the drug war. Um, with Professor Bob Cruz from Stanford. So thanks to everybody and Jay again, especially. Thank you very much for making the time and the excellent presentation. Thank you. I, I hope uh, folks found it entertaining and uh, educational. I'm sure they did. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna uh, stop the recording now and then uh, end the meeting. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a good rest of your evening. Good night. Thank you, Jay.